I'll, I guess I'll start off and then we'll hand it off to, to Lindsay. So uh, welcome. Thank you for putting up with the chaos. Um, we're living in a chaotic time and this sort of fits right in. Um, I'm Douglas McCullough. So I'm senior curator at the California Museum of Photography, part of UCR Arts. Um, we're the photography museum of the University of California. This exhibition that we're talking about is called Facing Fire, Art, wildfire and the end of nature in the new west and we have three artists from the show who are here in various locations um so that's noah berger and he's in his vehicle shooting fires for associated press and everyone and had a photo on the front of the la times this morning as well as in the new york times washington post everywhere else in the world that i can tell um samantha fields and uh, Norma Quintana, and I'll do bios, uh, very short bios since they all have like 40 page CVs. Um, but I'll, I'll hand it off to, uh, well, one, one quick thing, it's I'll take the time to say that this is really an opportune moment to be talking about wildfires, possibly important. Um, by the count that I saw about a half an hour ago, there are 367 official fires in California, and this, the governor is calling 23 of them major fires. So Samantha was just talking about fires potentially de devouring her Los Angeles hillside where she lives. Noah's out shooting fires, and Norma has been watching the fires from her house on the west side of Napa for the last several nights nervously because a previous house was burned in the Atlas peak fire in 2017, Norma's fire. So um, these are important issues linked to a lot of things. Lindsay. Yeah, the only thing, my name is Lindsay. I'm the manager of school and volunteer docent programs at UCR Arts. And um, just so happy to have everyone here for the kickoff of our third Thursday talks. Um, we'll have this once a month um, through the year. Um, and we'll be releasing the, the next few dates um, soon. Um, and so if you have any questions, please put them in the chat on YouTube. I'll be keeping an eye on that. And then I'll pop back in um, about, you know, 15 minutes before the program is going to end. And I will say we're going to go over um, till about 510. Um, and uh, so, yeah, just put the questions in the chat and then we'll get to them. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll give short bios and and the artists can jump in and disagree if, if, if they want and or correct. <laughs> um, Noah Berger is a freelance photographer based in the Bay Area who careens around California and works regularly for Associated Press and a whole bunch of other people, San Francisco Chronicle and New York Times. As I said, he has work all over the media from these current fires. Um, he, the story I heard from Noah is that he started at UC Berkeley for the Californian as like, I think a freshman um, working for the student paper and then got a side gig almost immediately at, when he was 18 or something like that and made 150 bucks doing a little bit of shooting and went, hey man, this is the life for me, which then uh, diverted his entire life into photography. Um, and wildfires are something I think beyond a specialty for Noah, there, as far as I can tell, this is my opinion, something of an obsession has been to, is, is sort of the weird dean of, of specialists in wildfires in California. Um, got a Pulitzer nomination last year. Samantha Fields, um, okay, I'm getting nods. <laughs> yes is from Noah. Uh, Samantha Fields is a professor of art at Cal State Northridge and has a BA from Cleveland, am I right about that? Institute of Art and then um, Cranbrook and has an insanely long exhibition history and is in roughly a zillion or a zillion and a half collections. And in my estimation is sort of a painter of disasters or something like that. Um, Norma Quintana has a master's from Case Western and a 20 year career in photography, um, a DAP, distributed monograph on circuses from 2014 or something like that. Founding board member of the San Francisco Photo Alliance, lives in Napa, and her engagement with FIRE is, direct engagement is that her house in Napa 
previous house burned down in 2017, as I said, in the Atlas Peak Fire. Um, with that, I will share in this sort of Zoom um, monologue mode, I will do, do a quick summary of the Facing Fire show or just some of the issues around it and a few things, and then we'll talk to Noah and everyone in, in sequence. So I will try and share my screen. First, I have to do a slideshow and, uh oh, I have lost how to share the screen now that I'm in slideshow mode. Hang on a second, more trouble. I'll, I'll fill share the time while Doug's looking with uh, thanking him <laughs> for putting us together and putting together an amazing show. And hopefully if COVID ever goes away and the exhibit is still up, you all should go. Doug, don't listen, you just keep working. Um, you all should go and look at it because he did an amazing job putting this together. And I think we all have deep, deep appreciation for him and the beautiful sound of his voice when we get to hear it also. So thank you. That's cool. Okay, are we now seeing this? Okay. Um, how's that? Yeah. Yes. All right. All right. All right. Sweet. Um, I'll repeat the title of the show. It's one of those double barreled um, art names. So it's, it's again, Facing Fire, Art, Wildfire, and the End of Nature in the New West. The opening reception for this show, it is up at the California Museum of Photography, um, was on February 29th of this year. About 600 people or more crowded the museum. It seems like some kind of other world. Um, all 16 artists in the show were there from all over the country, one from Europe. It's on two floors. Looking back, I, I looked it up. On that date, February 29th, 29th, there were 22 COVID cases in the United States. Reported four in Mexico, two in Brazil, and so on. Two weeks later, the museum was closed and like four or five days later, California was shut down by the governor. The subject of the show, pretty obviously, is wildfire, specifically California wildfires. And these artists all come at it from different angles. It is um, wildfire as metaphor, as personal experience, as subject in photojournalism. Um, as a quick aside, there are obviously direct parallels, fire is hugely metaphoric. And one of the parallels that is a new one is with between wildfire and COVID-19. They're both, you know, natural forces and destructive, but it kind of goes beyond that. Under, you know, fire conditions, which is like the wind in Napa now, where where um, Noah is, is sort of lurking and shooting, um, the sparks get ahead of the fire and start new advanced fires. They, they start fires outside the fire lines. With a virus, an infected person is the spark. You know, epidemiologists talk about the virus burning its way through a population, like, and then we are the tinder for COVID-19, and it burns through the world until enough people have been consumed or have immunity, or there's a vaccine that it, that it can no longer burn. Um, let's see here. Oh, okay, I'm trying to advance the, sorry about that. So this is the entrance to the exhibition. Um, I got interested in fires and wildfires for a number of reasons. The first is that they have all these layers of meaning. Wonderful minor white quote, you should photograph objects not only for what they are, but what else they are, what, what meaning they have. And fire is one of the central metaphors for humanity. It's, you know, here's the list. There's a long list, passion and punishment. It's kind of, you know, burning less, but it's also the lake of fire. It's inspiration, but it's anger. It's the cooking hearth. It's apocalypse. It's all of these things. A more direct path into this subject for me was this photograph, which is one of Noah's. And this is a, a little bit older one, 2016. It's the Blue Cut Fire, which is in Cajon Pass in Southern California. And when I saw this photo, I was like, wow, that is sort of unlike any fire photo I've ever seen. Usually it's a, a building being consumed or a tanker dropping retardant or something. And this 
is this landscape that seems to have consumed the whole world. It's unplaceable. There's barely any direct fire, but everything is embers and ash. And so this was in another show. This is one of the images from this show, which is one of Noah's and it's Justin Sullivan, another fire photographer shooting low at the campfire, which is the fire that burned through paradise 2018. And then here's Justin's photo in a situation like that with the sparks going by. Um, here's an installation shot of the exhibition. We hope it's been extended till January 17th and we hope that it will, you know, things will calm down enough that we can actually open the doors. So monitor the website of the California Museum of Photography, UCR Arts to see if that happens. There are other meanings that fire has taken on in of late. It, in the Anthropocene, it's now linked to climate change and us actually unbalancing the world, truthfully. Um, this is a photo by Christian Hogue, who purchases taxidermied animals from the era of the conquest of nature and then burns them in this sort of ritualistic release of the animals to close the cycle of what had been mankind capturing nature. And then this has let them loose in a way. And this is a California cougar that he bought at great expense um, and it's for this show. And this is the image from that. Kevin Cooley in Southern California, kind of a classic image that the New Yorker found irresistible and ran across a couple, a double truck um, with the California pool and being consumed. Fires have gotten more and more and more extreme. 16 of the 20 largest fires in California history are in the last 20 years. And we're just adding to it now. I checked CNN just before we came on here and about 500,000 acres have been burned in these latest fires. So all of these scenes are semi-apocalyptic. Stuart Pally from the show, Justin Sullivan, who we just saw down in the Sparks, shot this at the Kincaid fire last year. Stuart Pally in Santa Rosa. And meanwhile, life goes on. Um, people shooting hoops while the hillside burns in Altadena in Southern California by Kevin Cooley, a great photographer, and playing video games. Um, with that quick summary, I will, I will just say that, you know, that's like a, a, a kamikaze version of the show, but there is, um, the show is still up, so hopefully you can join us. There is a really nice, um, pretty ex completely extensive catalog published by Inlandia that you can get online anywhere, so it's facing fire. Um, and then there's all kinds of content on the virtual website and the website at UCR Arts. Um, so you can look at the show and experience all kinds of versions of it. With that, I will hand this to Noah Berger and show a photo of one of his pieces in, in, in the museum. Noah. Hi guys, thanks for tuning in, I'm unmuted. Um, yeah, I'm just gonna talk for a minute or two. And if anyone has questions, feel free to interrupt and post them and I think we'll see them because I think it's more interesting to respond to questions than to just talk. Um, so please interrupt. Um, yeah, so I've been a freelance photographer since 95 when I dropped out of Berkeley, as Doug said. And I started getting interested in fire in 2013 when Justin and I did the rim fire outside of Yosemite, which was massive. It didn't have a lot of consequences in terms of people or homes. It was a massive fire and the two of us were out there and we'd done some others before, but that really got us, for lack of a better word, hooked on it. And we said like, this is what we want to do during, during summers and falls. So it's kind of been a gradual progression every year of learning more about it, learning more about the firefighters and meshing with their communities online and in person. And every year we include, we up our safety gear, we up the tools that we use to cover these and add a new exciting thing every year that makes it better. Um, so it's been a great learning thing over the last five or six years and it's just kind of luckily for us coincided with fires getting bigger, bolder, more destructive um, at the same time. 
I'm sure nobody in California, at least, is not aware of the increasing severity. Um, so yeah, it's been pretty much from July through September um, covering fires as well as other news. I do a lot of violent stuff, so news and protests. Um, but the fire is definitely a really big passion and I love doing it. Um, trying to think what else I could say. Anybody have questions, please chime in. Um, I definitely approach it more from a news aspect than a art aspect. I mean, I'm first and foremost a news photographer. Um, so your the goal is kind of to capture, the first priority is that it has to be truthful. And then the second is to make it artistic and compelling, but the art can't come before, before the truth and the news value of it. And sometimes you push that with slow exposures and you know other techniques you use, the toning, but first and foremost, it's to tell the story about what's happening for people who can't see it. Um, one of the things that, the reason you see these photos out of California and you don't see them from other states is we have a unique um, press access law here. It's a section of the penal code 4095D that allows press to go into closed areas that have been cordoned off for emergency. So I am wearing full firefighter gear, but with a, with a press credential, legally you're supposed to be able to walk into a wall of flames if you want. Um, <laughs> we do. Um, so yeah, that's, that's one of the reasons people kind of think like, why don't you see these photos from other states? And that's why it's not because they don't have great photographers, it's because they don't have the access that we do. I think I'll just wrap there, I don't know. I don't know if you can, uh, can you hear, can you hear this question? I'm, I'm showing. Can people hear the question? Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, I, the, the, the screen is showing the photo of four people at the Wawona tunnel entrance overlooking Yosemite Valley in a fire that is completely filled the, the valley with smoke. What, what was the scene there? I mean, that's such a famous place. Ansel Adams photos, many other photos shot from very close to that spot. There is a good backstory to that. That leads into other things. One of the things I do is live in my car for four or five days while doing this. I have an Xterra, which I'm in, that's very well outfitted to sleeping. And most of us will stay out there in our cars. It's just easier than trying to drive out and get to a hotel. Um, and I'm really comfortable in here. Um, so I was actually camped at that rest stop overnight and i woke up at like 6 30 in the morning usually we'll shoot fires maybe it was eight in the morning usually we'll shoot fires until two or three at night sleep for a couple hours and get up and do it again and i got up and i think i was in my boxers and i looked out the car window and these kids were out there looking at the hazy valley so i shot them went over and got their names and filed it and it ended up on the front of the new york times the next day which was kind of cool but what really makes it special for us is like when you can get a compelling photo out at eight in the morning it really frees up the rest of your day because on news we're looking <laughs> at headlines um, so right now my editor is probably thinking why is it six o'clock and you've only sent or four o'clock and you've only sent two photos but when you get something out that you're happy with at that time of day it really gives you a lot of breathing room <laughs> which didn't right. happen this morning okay <laughs> All right, I guess what we'll do is we'll, we'll, we'll carry on with Samantha um, and then we'll circle back with all the questions out of the chat. So uh, Samantha Fields. Okay, I'm unmuted. All right. You can hear me. Yes. Yep. <laughs> Great, okay, so this is a little installation view. Um, uh, in the museum, which looks wonderful. And you can go ahead to the next slide. Uh, so this piece is called Another Week in the Death of America. And I suppose I'm the artist who's um, working with fire as a metaphor. So in this, in particular, I go out chasing as well, but I don't have that nice press pass. So I'm usually on the fringes of things, um, kind of going where I can, when I can. I keep all my stuff in my car all the time. You know, you're kind of always ready. But I think with me, the way that I deal with the fires is I don't necessarily go out looking for them far away. I kind of deal with what falls into my path, right? So I'm, I'm often locating myself in relation to the landscape around me. So this isn't far from me, this is Magic Mountain. And I, the idea of us entertaining ourselves to death while the wor world burns to me was an interesting allegory. So the roller coasters with the plume behind and then the kid on the bike rolled up right then and it was just, it, it just came together 
in a way that I felt was representative of larger problems in the world. So this one, you can see me working here in my studio. I make all my paintings with an airbrush. So they're all acrylic on canvas made with an airbrush. I seldom touch the painting, but um, in that last one, I had to tape off the roller coasters. They were just too precise to do freehand with an airbrush. So you can see me laboriously um, putting all the tape on the painting there. And then the next image, uh, this is one of my uh, maps. I save everything. I'm a jotter of things. I'm a keeper of records. Uh, so this was, I don't remember what year this was. What was the year of the Triangle Complex fire? Griffith Park burned that year. This was the year of the magic fire. Um, 2007 on this. Oh, it's 2007. Yeah, that was a crazy year. That's the year I got married. Um, and, uh, you know, this, I, I finally learned like Noah to start listening to scanners at a certain point. Um, and that's, but but you know some of these fires i would be off shooting one and see another one start so the magic fire which was that first image that you saw i was on my way to castaic which is on this map um to shoot that and i saw the magic fire actually starting and so i ended up staying all day for that fire and and that kid that roller coaster photo is one of the last ones that i took um, so on the next slide, this is from my sketchbook from that same year. And I feel like at this moment, we're exactly here again. There's a plume on every horizon. Like it doesn't matter which way you look. And the plume for me is a big metaphor because in literature, in movies, a plume on the horizon is never a good sign. You know, you never see a plume on the horizon. You're like, hooray. It's always like pirates or renegades if you're watching Westerns or see, you know, whatever. Here in California, it's always bad news, you know? And so to me, that kind of like indication of danger from afar is, is a really powerful thing to think about. And so here is that Triangle Complex fire. Um, <laughs> funny, this one, when I when I shot the photograph that resulted in this painting, I, I noted when Noah said, you know, I have to, my photographs have to be truthful because they're news. Well, I'm making paintings, so I don't have to be truthful. Um, a lot of my landscapes are constructed. So actually at the bottom of this image, there actually is a subdivision, which I took out. So in this work, I was wanting these to look like they could be anywhere. Kind of like Doug, you're talking that first painting with the, that first photograph with the sparks. Like it, it becomes any place and every place. And by removing the geographic markers, you know, the houses, the signs, I felt like this could be any plume anywhere. Um, and this image is actually that same plume, but it's zoomed in on a tiny, tiny part. And you can actually see the super tanker um, quite tiny there. And so this painting is actually um, also a quite a large painting, but it, it kind of shows that power of cropping and painting, right? <laughs> Where one is the zoomed back view and one's the zoomed in view. Um, and if you move to the next one, this is my source image. So this is the photograph. Um, I print my photographs uh, with the inkjet printer, which simulates the paint flying out of the airbrush. So I have this really interesting and complicated relationship with uh, photography and printing and then mechanical means of reproduction. Hi, Walter Benjamin. Um, and I could talk about that geeky stuff forever, but uh, the fun thing about these is this is where I test all the colors. So as I'm mixing the color, I'm always kind of blobbing it onto these sheets to make sure that, um, that the color is accurate before I paint. And so these last two, uh, Doug put a couple of details in. Um, in the first slide, you saw that grid on the wall. That was actually, I think there's 48 of them in this show. I made a hundred of these six inch by six inch paintings um, of various fires um, spanning, I think three years in Los Angeles. It was that kind of 2006 through 2008 season, 2009, where things really ramped up. Um, and the series was called Containment. And so they're squares because the square is hyper-rational. And it's like this idea that you can contain the fire, you know, is becoming for us, I think, increasingly difficult to wrap our minds around um, when we have these complex fires. Um, and these are teeny tiny, unlike my other paintings, because I do like to reference the way we view fires in media. So that to me is a really interesting relationship too. So I'll leave it there. Thank you, Doug. All right, Norma Quintana. And here's an installation view from the museum with some of Norma's work. She has a large 
a, a, a major precinct in this show. Norma? Yes, can you hear me? Yeah. Great. Um, well, oh, first of all, um, I currently have a big knot in my stomach because, you know, this is very PTSD to say the least as, a, as somebody who survived a fire um, in 2017. And so as a kind of a short in introduction, um, so I'm an analog photographer. So I had all my equipment and my dark room and everything just um, disappeared in the night of October 9th at the Atlas Peak Fire. So my work is really like a, a personal story because I think certainly, and it's appropriately that when people are um, talking about the fire, it, there's this collective experience, but mine is a, obviously an individual experience. And so I'm thinking already of all those people who have, are losing their homes or have lost their homes and what they're going to experience, I, I, I'm almost, I'm, at, I'm there already with them and they are not because they're probably trying to find housing, trying to, um, you know, trying to figure out what they're going to do next. And so imagine after the fire, then you go to your property and you witness, and those will be the shots you'll see next, I'm sure, in the media of people who will go to their homes and, um, and just, ex just to really witness um, personally what, what they, you know, what, what happened. And so my work um, evolved uh, pretty organically because it wasn't something I planned, of course. Um, I'm an analog photographer and now all my work is from my iPhone. So um, I call myself an accidental iPhone photographer. So what I ended up doing is I went to the site where my home was and my studio I sifted and then I, with time, day after day, um, you know, found um, items that were my part of my life and they're really about memory. So, and people would ask often if I found, um, for example, like a, a, a wedding ring and that sort of thing. And that's, those are things you don't really find. I mean, I just, I, for me, it was just about trying to connect with my past and so it's it's kind of a it's a kind of a visual memoir uh, with the things that I have and so they were they all have a memory so it's really about different memories and so if you see I have you know a cross um, I've had um, jewelry I had a camera um, that was um, underneath the rubble of where my studio was um, I also had, you'll see um, film, because as an analog photographer, um, the reels of a, of a camera, so I filmed, I had a passport photo um, that I found, which was amazing because ephemera is the first thing that um, disappear, uh, disappears. And I only found one photograph, um, which it, uh, it's interesting because I know exactly when it was taken, where it was taken, and I hadn't seen that in years because my children are older now. So that was sweet. When I saw that, it was a kind of a sweet moment. So I think what I, um, what I bring to the, to the exhibition is, is a personal experience, um, a haunting experience, a crushing experience, but I also feel like it's hopeful if I could as an artist create work through this traumatic experience. Um, I think it was very hopeful. I heard from a lot of people who um, reached out to me and um, they were really saddened by it, but they also really encouraged me. And so I just created and created the work and then evolved into a series that again, I call Forage from Fire and it's, I just can't believe that it's happening again. So for me, it's very raw. So, um, but if anybody out there has any questions for any of us or me, uh, let me know. 
All right, I'm, I'll stop sharing. And I, perhaps Lindsay has been monitoring the chat and see if anybody has, has any questions. If not, yes. I can. We do. So, um, and I'll ask this first one that was addressed to Noah while we still have him um, in case he needs to run away. Um, Noah, this is from Patrick Gibson. Noah, when you are capturing images in mere seconds beyond the capturing of an image, to what extent are you also simultaneously considering narrative or art when you take the photo? Oh, you're on mute still. <laughs> um, I'm not considering like the art down the road. I am considering if it looks better than Josh and Justin's photo, which <laughs> is what I want to happen. Um, you know, seriously, I, I am considering the aesthetics, but I wouldn't say I'm considering it as like a lasting piece of art at all. You know, I'll just do a quick follow up, though. I, the, uh, there was a second photo inside the LA Times print run this morning, which was, I don't know where it was, but it was burned out cars beneath uh, the skeletal remains of a tree. And I thought, you know, that really, really, honest to God, is an art photo. It happens to be burned tree, and it happens to have burned cars, very small, really, in, below. But it's essentially a photo of a tree that's, like, super artful. And, like, it, it really is. So... Yeah, that, that was the wild side. That was yesterday morning, and I hadn't slept because I'd been doing fire all night. And the goal for news is, you know, we kind of live on a news cycle, and you try to get a couple pictures from daylight in, and then you go to sleep so that newspapers are fed for the next eight hours. Um, <laughs> so, that, so that's it, I love that photo, but that's what that is. That's me trying to get in a current Dateline photo before going to sleep with some. Okay. I love your sort of disingenuous, oh, no, I'm not aiming for art. I was just exhausted and I need to feed the beast. But in reality, there's art in there. Yeah, that's accurate. All right. <laughs> Lindsay. Okay, let's see. Um, another question um, from um, Tim Woodlock, our own Tim from our um, prep department. He asked, do any of you have thoughts on fires connected to the West? Let me put that in quotes. Well, um, when it comes to me, I'm from Ohio originally, and I just don't remember any fires. So it's it's very, um, it's very specific, you know, to this area particularly. Um, and if you live here long enough and you see the topography, you can see why it happens. I mean, it's very populated, but it's also rocky. It's very um, there's just a lot of trees, and so um, and this. This particular series of fires, um, I mean, before, as you all know, uh, with the Atlas Peak fire, the one that um, that occurred in 2017, it was both the winds, but it was also PG&E. So there's that whole history with, with the Atlas Peak fires particularly. Um, this was nature. This was, um, which is what's perplexing because everybody wants to know where the fires are or uh, is it coming your direction and that sort of thing. So um, so I think it's about the landscape. I think it's about, um, you know, nature. Um, you think you're away from it and particularly these areas where there are a lot of, you don't see that people are living there, but they're, I'm sure um, Noah sees this where there are rent people who have their homes away from the center of town and that sort of thing. So um, I think that's the, the, the Western part of it. And I experienced it just driving down to, to UC to see the exhibition. And I didn't realize even having lived in California, how also very dry it was. I noticed that. And at Riverside, when I drove, maybe to the back of how you know of how I could see how the fires would occur as well. So, and it's it's funny, um, Norma. I'm also from Ohio, so yeah. we're both Ohioans, and you know I've learned a lot about the California ecosystem in the last 23 years of living here. And you know the fires are a natural part of our ecosystem. And when you start to read about this and learn about it, it's it's only us and our suppression and our building that causes these configurations if they burn normally and we didn't have you know climate change and accelerated warming right. you know it, it the sequoias don't um germinate without fire so it's interesting also to read about how the in indigenous people of the west actually 
um, did their own controlled burns and lived with fire and moved with fire and lived in harmony with it in a way, um, which we are in constant opposition. So again, that metaphor for me is always like, I think of manifest destiny and our Western movement and, and that this, I don't know, it, it's very karmic in some ways, like our pushing towards the ocean and now the fire pushes us off the land. So it, it's an interesting thing to think about in this kind of larger historical sense. That's actually a perfect segue into um, the, the next question, which you, you may have already addressed it, but um, Macy Ring asks, I'm interested in hearing if any of our guests have researched or will talk about cultural burning as practiced by native indigenous groups. Does anyone else have anything to add to that? Or? So you kind of that. What's that? Sam kind of nailed that one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I, I, I talked to a lot of fire ecologists and they all, many of them actually, a number of them have specialized in, in all these things that we've mentioned, which is that indigenous people would burn sections and it would, all, it would be a limited burn because it would burn up to the, to the burn, previous burn and so on. So very patchwork. And people have mapped that out. So the, exactly, exactly as Samantha said, the conflagrations are a result of extreme suppression and, and an escape from that. So, um, and also if you look at photos by Carlton Watkins of Yosemite Valley from above, like from a viewpoint like Noah's photo we were talking about, is the valley floor was way more open, meadow-like, because it had been burned off and burned off and burned off, you know, as sort of management of that. Um, it was a different relationship with the place. Now, we distinctly don't have that relationship and really, can't you would burn everything down to try and get back to that it's a western it is a western phenomenon though getting back to the previous question another question um about the west is um another one from macy ring do you think your work perpetuates what western mainstream media culture says about fire that fire is something to be fearful of instead fire is something that creates rejuvenates and generates and that's been touched on as well too, but does anyone else wanna add to that? Read the question one more time, I'll, I'll take it. Let me just oh, yeah. make sure that her words right. Okay, um, do you think your work perpetuates what Western mainstream media culture says about fire? It, that fire is something to be fearful of. Instead, fire is something that creates, rejuvenates and generates. I mean, I guess the answer would be yes, but I don't think it's a, something that the media is creating. I mean, that's, Kind of the world we live in that nobody wants to lose their beautiful home that they've built in the woods um so i i would say it probably reflects more than perpetuates our focus on property and our focus on homes and protecting them at all costs even in firefighter lives um I mean, it's true, lightning, you know, especially these lightning complex are a completely natural part of the environment. Like you said, they're good for some species, they're good for some some trees, they're good for the environment. Um, and it, it really is, the firefighters call it the WUI, the wildland urban interface, and that we've extended more into the woods than we used to, and we're not as mobile. I assume as Native American communities, you can't, you know, it's a lot harder to, you know, pick up your million dollar home and, and move it as a fire comes close. Um, so. I don't know. It's a, I wouldn't say it's in, in a negative way, but yes, I mean, I think we reflect people's focus on possessions and that property. You know, I'll just jump in as the curator because we, we have three, three of 16 artists represented here. And in thinking about this show and looking at a lot of work, part of my goal was to have a, a very broad set of different angles at this. And so the exhibition as a whole or the catalog of the exhibition really has multiple viewpoints on this. And some, some stress the rejuvenation, some stress um, the personal experience, others are a document which transcends to an art level, others are metaphoric. Um, so it's a very complicated, humanity has an extremely complicated relationship with fire. We are utterly linked to fire. Fire enables what we do. Um, and, and has for hundreds of thousands of years. The, the earliest caves have a hearth and you needed fire. So the relationship is extremely layered and extremely complicated. And my, you know, I wanted to capture just a little bit of that complexity in these different, you know, 16 artists looking at it from different angles. So 
Yeah, it, it's interesting because in, you know, in, in where I live, there are a lot of people who rebuilt in the same spot that they lost their house. And I understand that because, I mean, I didn't do that, but, um, and I recall in the 2017 fire that somebody had lost their house twice and this was going to be their third time <laughs> they lost it. And so it's, it's, it, you, you'll see that, you know, fast forward, God willing, um, everything will, it will be, um, uh, we'll get back to, to some normal, if you can imagine that. And then, um, and then people will build, you know, they'll build back in the house and um, have, you know, they'll consume and that sort of thing. So, um, so, but I do, I have to say there are a lot of people that I know are a little bit more ready. They have their bags ready. So there's a lot more information, which is actually quite good. A lot of people are getting the Nixle alerts and people understand people are evacuating. So Noah, you probably know from the people need to leave when they say evacuate, you need to evacuate. So, um, so I do see kind of a different relationship to it, but I, people have very short, you know, memories. They will build, they will, you know, the, the, the developments will continue. I mean, this is not going to necessarily, um, um, stop. And then in terms of possessions, I mean, I quickly, well, not quickly, but, um, you know, have my art books, uh, my favorite art books, again, prints that people have sent me. So I, you know, those things that I lost, I was able to, um, to, to somehow replace. And so my life goes on as well. So that's comforting to anybody who, who, you know, uh, just experienced loss, you know, mm -hmm. it, it, yeah, it, um, that's part of my current story is that. But I'll tell you, every time I see the images, you know, it just tugs at my heart. It's just, a, it's a very, and it's a very stressful time for a lot of people. It's pretty PTSD for everybody. So I hope you're keeping the new possessions in your new concrete and cinder block house. <laughs> um, uh, no. <laughs> well, would I be any different? <laughs> But it's interesting because right now, as I'm on, and, and with, you know on this um, meeting, my husband is out with a big hose, just watering everything. And I took down um, several trees uh, in the past couple months, and one today, massive tree. So you know, we're just very hyper aware. I have to say, which is a which is a good thing. I tell people just, and and the other thing about West, I always I've been I've been telling people that. One thing I learned being this Midwesterner was that you know, this term, you know, you're in the wild, wild west is really true because I, and this is not to be negative about community, but I, I felt that um, you're kind of on your own, you know, which is why I understand why people, some people stay behind and fight the fire and get the hoses and then get their families because there are no firefighters, you know, not that, not enough firefighters to take care of everybody. Because everybody's wondering where are the firefighters, where are the sirens, where are the planes? It's just not enough. I mean, you know, no one knows that from what's happening. There, it, 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 you know, for me that was my question. I kept asking when it occurred to me. Now that I'm witnessing it, I realize why they couldn't possibly, and that they have to save lives, and that's their priority. I, I will throw in a very quickly a story of, of the photographer John Devola, who's pretty well known and has a house on a hill in Southern California. And there was a fire maybe two years ago that burned right up to his, to the edge of his property. And he was there looking at it and a firefighter showed up and started taking photographs of the fire. One firefighter, he's like, wait a second, I'm the photographer. Where are the firefighters? <laughs> <laughs> oh, Doug, that's so funny. Cause whenever I go out shooting, I, I always know I'm in a good spot if, um, if I if I see firefighters, because on their breaks they'll rotate out and they all have like cameras and then that's what they do. And there's there's also I've run into a lot of like kind of fringe weirdos who like to watch fires. Wait, hang um, on, hang on. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Totally. Yeah. yeah, like people making documentaries, like all kinds of I've met a lot of interesting people. Um uh kind of photographing the fires. But going back to Maya's question, which I think is such a good one. And it's interesting that Norma and I are both from Ohio, but we have very different 
um, experiences with the fire. Hers is so personal and intense. And then Noah's kind of an objective observer. And then for me, I'm very interested in the larger um, socioeconomic um, ramifications of our relationship to the relation of to, to the landscape, especially in this age of climate change um, and extreme weather. You know, I've also done big storms. I do I do fires aren't the only thing I work with. And um, and especially our own complicity, you know, mentioning people who build back in the same place. And I think when you critique something, and I, I, my work is definitely a critique of late stage capitalism. I myself am not exempt from that critique. Like we are all complicit. Like I am complicit. We are here. We live in California. We own property in California. I own property in California. So it's like, it's this kind of thing that you, I always say to my students, we critique what we love. You know, and it's like, I love this place. Like, I'm not from here, but I love it. And, but I, I understand so deeply and profoundly the problems with being here in this place. Like, I, I recommend all the time, and Doug, we've talked about this the Mike Davis chapter um, from Ecology of Fear, the case for letting Malibu burn. And you have to think about it all the time, you know, like as a society, the choices that we make have big, big ramifications and they ripple through the generations. Yeah, that's beautiful. And that is a great piece of writing, Mike Davis. Yeah, <sighs> Terrific. Lindsay, anything else or should we wrap up or more questions? That looks I like, know, that looks like all the questions. Any, any parting words before we go? Um, I know Noah probably has to run soon, so. <laughs> I, I will bow out. I will bow out here. It was great to see you guys, but I have oh, to all right. Just, Stay safe. Bye all. Yeah. All right. Yeah, and if, if anybody that you know has um, experienced any kind of loss or, you know, please, you know, send, send, have them send me an email or reach out to me because I, I'm there for them. If there's any kind of, you know, um, wisdom I can impart and that'll come later. It doesn't come now. So. Thank you. Feel, so feel free to reach out to UCR Arts and we'll get you in touch with Norma. Um, thank you so much to all the artists for joining us today and for Doug for the um, wonderful exhibition. And I hope everyone will come visit when we're able to reopen. The exhibition has been extended to January 17th and um, we're currently we're working on our reopening plans. So as soon as we get the green light, we'll um, be announcing when we can reopen. Um, and please join us for the next Third Thursday talk. We're gonna be posting the link um, in the chat um, in just a moment. Yep, I see it there now. Um, we'll be talking with Nigel Whitson and they are a, um, they're an artist who has won, a multidisciplinary artist who has won two Bessie Awards. Um, they're a writer, a um, performance artist, a choreographer. So that'll be a great talk on September 17th. Um, and if you're able to, if you're in the position to donate to UCR Arts, um, that will help us um, continue to do programs like this. So we've um, put our donation link in there as well. And um, again, thank you so much to Norma, Samantha, and Doug. Um, and um, we'll go ahead and sign off. Thank you, guys. Thank you everybody. Thanks for watching.